myself. I'm Virginia Latore Yaker. I've been a member of the New York State Bar since 1984. And I've been based in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates since 2001. Prior to that, I was practicing in Hong Kong for 15 years. So my experience is very much international and I deal with clients that have many international types of uh, contacts and issues. So I'm not dealing with strictly domestic clients. I specialize in international US tax planning, the latest changes in American tax laws and tax obligations for American expats and foreign persons with US connections. And predominantly, my practice has been focusing on FATCA, becoming US tax compliant, expatriation issues, and more recently with the interplay between Sharia law and the US tax law. So that's my expertise and areas of practice. And Jimmy has um, been practicing for just about the same amount of time. He's the founder and CEO of Esquire Group, which is an international tax advisory firm. And he has offices in Austria, Germany, the US and the UAE. And Jimmy specializes in consulting and international taxation, including um, for US citizens with foreign income or assets. He deals heavily with expatriation issues. He also works intensively with family office issues, succession planning, and structures for high net worth individuals, as well as corporate structures. Jimmy, in addition to English, speaks German very fluently. So, this seminar, webinar, as you know, deals with the closure of the OBDP program. Before we get into what's happening as it closes, let's just emphasize that life for Americans abroad, we all know, is becoming extremely difficult. And if you have hidden tax problems, then I believe your life is going to become just about impossible. How did all of this start? It all started way back in 2007 when Bradley Birkenfeld blew the whistle on UBS and advised the US government that UBS was helping Americans to avoid US taxes through foreign accounts that were not reported. When the IRS got this information, they started for the first time, the Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program, or OVDP, in 2009. OVDP has been going on since then. It's had various iterations and different penalty structures and different rules throughout its tenure, which has gone through. Um, the latest one is the 2014 program. And each time the IRS has instituted a new version of the OVDP, they have imposed harsher penalties. And at this time, they've had about 56,000 taxpayers joining the Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Program, and they've collected over $11 billion in tax penalties and interest. So why do we think the IRS is closing the OBDP? Which, by the way, it is closing September 28th, which means when they say closing, they mean you have to have everything sent to them. It has to be a completed package sent to the IRS by, t by the 28th of September. We think that the IRS likely did not have the ability to mine all of the data it's collected since 2009 when it first started the OBDP. Because as if any of you are familiar with that program, the OBDP requires an awful lot of information to be submitted by every taxpayer that enters the program. And this information is being fed into the IRS computers, so they have an awful lot of data, where money was moved, how much money was moved, who were the advisors involved with the various structures that were set up. And they've just been co connecting all of the dots for the past several years and we think now that they have the ability especially with the FATCA information coming into them they're they're getting more and more sophisticated and they're developing ways to track this data more carefully and mine it 
So there's a, a less incentive for the IRS to say, well, we need people to come and tell us that they've been non-compliant. They are now becoming closer to the position of saying we can find them. Um, so we, we think that the IRS position is coming to the point where they, they believe they've given people enough time to get their act together and become tax compliant with the inference being, if you're not taking action, that the IRS may be saying your tax non-compliance has been willful. And once you get into the willful area, you're going to have some, some serious penalties that can be imposed. Um, Jimmy, are you with us now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, like Virginia was saying, um, you know, the IRS is, is closing the o OBD fee. And, and what, is, what does this really mean? And, and what sort of indications of the IR, has the IRS given um, as to why they, they may be closing the OBDP and what their position may be going forward uh, in terms of, of taxpayers with, with undisclosed foreign income and assets? And, you know, one, one of the things that happened is when FATCA was, was first announced, uh, there was this mass panic of Americans abroad thinking that they were, you know, going to go to jail for these, uh, you know, unfiled FBARs and, and, and undeclared income. And, you know, there was this mass panic to get, get into compliance. Well, as the years have, have gone on, the, the IRS has been collecting all of this, this FATCA data, as well as data from, from Swiss banks. Uh, it, and, and data they've received through mutual legal assistance requests and so on and so forth. But there hasn't really been anything that we've seen that's really happened with this data. You know, I don't know, Virginia, if, if you know, but I'm not aware of thus far one single audit, indictment, or anything else that's come from all this FATCA data. Um, I agree. And, I haven't and, and seen so I, anything. And from the latest and, government reports I've seen, the TIGTA reports, the um, the data is is messy. The IRS is having problems with its treaty-based exchanges of information, and I'm guessing, I'm guessing that the FATCA stuff must be even more disorganized, at least at the time of that report. C correct. And, and, and so, you know, v Virginia and I have, have often spoken about this, so we've kind of been of the opinion that, uh, you know, the FATCA data and all the, this other data that the IRS has gotten has kind of gone into a data black hole. Um, and so the IRS had all these amnesty programs available uh, for, so people could come to the IRS and get back into compliance because the IRS didn't really have the ability to go through the data they had in order to you know, go after the taxpayers. And so we think OBDP is closing because that paradigm is shifting um, mm -hmm. and that the IRS is, is now getting the ability to mine this data. And, and a couple of things in the timeline leading up to, to this announcement that came earlier in March was that in August of 2017, the new IRS criminal investigation chief, Don Fort, announced the formation of a new uh, international Tax Enforcement Group uh, within the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. Then, you know, uh, about a month and a half later, um, in October 2017, the, the IRS Criminal Investigation uh, Division Deputy Chief uh, Eric Hilton announced that the IRS is, is going to start combining the FATCA data with other data gathered, which would be through mutual legal assistance programs and stuff like that, and sending it over to IRS criminal investigation for, for mining and actions. Then in December of 2017, the IRS announced that it's going to start sending nudge letters uh, to taxpayers whose data they received from Swiss banks. So as, as some of you may know, there's several Swiss banks that took part in basically uh, sort of an offshore voluntary disclosure um, program for foreign banks. And many taxpayers signed waivers allowing their, their data to go to the United States. And this comment indicates to me 
that they now know who these taxpayers are that haven't com complied because they're going to start sending them nudge letters, which means they've now processed that data. And, and there was a recent case, Virginia, I don't know if you saw this, this was, was I think last week, that there was a, a, a lawsuit in federal district court where a, a whistleblower was basically claiming uh, the IRS was trying to say that the reward was only based on the amount of tax collected. Uh, and mm -hmm. the whistleblower was arguing that it should, uh, that, the, that the recovery percentage, the reward should be on the taxes, interest, and penalties um, that have been collected. And the, the whistleblower won. So now, uh, you know, whistleblower rewards will be based on, on this cumulative amount of tax, interest, and penalties rather than just um, the tax, which is, you know, a, a bigger incentive for, for whistleblowers to come forward. And I believe that case was actually with regard to one of the Swiss banks, if, if memory serves. Um, okay, so it would include the FBAR penalties, Jimmy? I remember there was an issue with it wouldn't include FBAR penalty several years I ago. I don't believe this had, well. yeah, I don't believe this was FBAR penalties. This was, mm -hmm. this was the case um, where it was a, a whistleblower for one of the Swiss banks that, that I think it was actually UBS where they, they turned in the, the clients. And okay. the, the IRS tried to just pay the amount on the taxes collected. And the, um, the whistleblower sued saying, no, it should be, you know, the taxes, interest, and penalties. And, and the judge agreed. Okay, um, so they sweeten the deal for the whistleblowers. Got it. Correct. They're, they're sweetening the deal for the whistleblowers. And so, so now, you know, I think, um, you know, like Virginia was saying, with, with the, the OBDP going away, uh, you know, there are several different amnesty programs that taxpayers can use to get back into compliance. But the OVDP is the only one that you can use if there's been potential criminal activity or, you know, willful behavior. Um, and where there's still sort of a guarantee of non-prosecution, you get to, you know, you get certainty around the penalty structure uh, and, and, and so forth. And that's going to be going away. So, this, so with OVDP gone, the only route for people that, that were, were maybe were willful um, is going to be to go through what's, what's called a, a, just a regular voluntary disclosure uh, program, which is uh, not quite as uh, rigid. There's not qu quite as much of a framework as an OBDP. We'll talk more about that later. Um, as Virginia said, with OBDB closing, it's sort of an indication that the IRS believes people have had enough of a chance to, to get back into compliance. And, and you know, I, I think that, that there's probably going to be a fairly large rush of people trying to take advantage of OBDP's um, benefits but before it ends and there's potentially, you know, tougher, tougher enforcement. Mm -hmm. I think what people have to be very aware of is that OVDP, first of all, it's not for everybody. I don't think, you know, everybody needs to panic because OVDP is closing. But I, I do believe that people who have not come into compliance need to get some advice as to what their options are and what, what options look most reasonable for their particular facts. Um, I, I don't like when professionals try and scare people to get them to join a program like OBDP if it's not suitable. But unfortunately, some people do have real criminal elements in their case, and those people really don't have any other choice other than OBDP, unless they want to continue hiding and hoping for the best. But there are many, many, many clients that I see who are you know, very fearful, think they need to go into OVDP. And then when we really go through their facts very carefully, we see that there may be other options for them. So I, I think that people yeah. have to be very selective in who they speak to and maybe get a second opinion. And, 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 the, one, and the one thing that I, I would add to, to what you're saying, Virginia, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right there. I, I, and I think one of the things, you know, with, with OVDP, um, you know, that a lot of people sort of think that, um, 
you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, tax professionals out there that are like, oh, you know, if you don't do OBDP, you're going to go to jail. But I think for, for me, I think one of the, you know, most impactful things with OBDP going away is with, as we'll talk a little bit about later, you know, with the court's sort of new widened definition of, of willfulness, mm -hmm. um, even somebody that, that didn't really have criminal intent, but maybe just sort of ignored a situation or something could potentially be considered willful and, and OBDP would, would be the most, would be the safest option, let's say. Um, and, and that's potentially, those folks are, are no, no longer going to have OVDP as an option. And to, to me, that's going to be the, the biggest impact. I agree. I agree there. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you would clean up your U.S. tax mess, okay? So first, obviously, we've said you, you should seek professional tax advice. And again, be careful who you choose. Get a second opinion. What you've got to do is obtain a full understanding of whatever possible civil and or criminal implications you're facing. So you would learn about OBDP and any other options that might be possible for you to consider. So let's look briefly at these other options. Whether or not you're going to have other options will really depend on the specific facts of your case. So when you get tax advice or what I do with clients is I go through what may be possible for them and they have to understand the risks and possible penalties involved with each option. So if someone said, well, what if I just decided I'm not going to worry about the past that I was non-compliant for so many years and I'm just going to start with this tax year and comply from this tax year forward and forget about the past. That's a possibility, but it, of course, comes with certain risks. What about if the client thinks he wants to just file his back returns or his incorrectly filed returns by amending or filing delinquent returns and FBARs? That will carry its own set of risks. Um, what about delinquent submission procedures, streamlined filing procedures, OBDP? All of these options may be available once you go through your first step and determine this issue of willfulness because if you've got willfulness in your tax non-compliance many of the options don't really make sense for you or will come with greater risks for you so the, the court definition is an intentional violation of a known legal duty and if you look at the IR IRM, the Internal Revenue Manual, you'll see that they apply really a two-part test. The taxpayer has knowledge of the reporting requirements and he makes a conscious choice not to comply. So when you're looking at this conscious choice not to comply and you, this whole issue of willfulness, you can't get inside a person's head, if you, even if you're the IRS, okay? You've got to prove that state of mind, usually by circumstantial evidence. So what a good tax advisor will really be looking at are what conduct and acts can the IRS pinpoint to show that person's state of mind. And so you, would, you have to ask questions and, and you know a lot of clients really don't like when you start digging and asking all of these questions, but without asking everything, you will not be able to give that taxpayer good advice. So for example, you wanna find out what did he tell his tax return preparer? Did he complete a tax organizer for the return preparer? And, and you want to see it. You want to go through line by line what he has said. Did he disclose his foreign accounts? Were there any structures involved in, in this taxpayer situation? For example, did he have foreign entities such as corporations or foreign trusts? And if so, how did he come about them? Maybe he inherited shares in a foreign company from, from his family member who passed away, or maybe he was named as the beneficiary of a foreign trust, as opposed to he created them and tried to hide his true ownership. So there's an awful lot of questioning that needs to go on to understand a, a, a client's matter. And um, that's the only way you're going to be able to make a decent level of inquiry with regard to 
his state of mind and whether he, he had this willfulness. What I've been seeing is that the courts are now expanding, and Jimmy mentioned this earlier, they are expanding on this definition of willfulness. And we have to be very careful about this to see where this is gonna end up going. Several years back, we had the court introduce the concept of something called willful blindness. And basically this is saying the taxpayer's kind of closing his eyes to um, getting further information or learning about his tax duties. And another, concept we're seeing is this concept of recklessness. The concept is the person is being very reckless in what he's doing with his tax situation. Um, when they're looking at this, the courts are looking at various factors, the taxpayer's level of education, his business experience. Was he born and raised in, in the US? Did he you know, go in as an immigrant? and eventually get a green card what you know what's what is his fact pattern i will say the cases that i've been really studying when they talk about the reckless concept i'm seeing very bad facts in those cases and i don't know why the courts are even looking to put a label of reckless reckless behavior on the taxpayer when i think the taxpayer's facts are so bad in the case, for example, you know, he he didn't tell his accountant or that he had foreign assets. And, and there's evidence that he was trying to um and, and, and one, one, one thing one thing that I would add to that, Virginia, I mean when we're talking about like bad facts is you know, I think it's important is not only did in, in these cases that we're talking about, not only did the taxpayer not tell his accountant. Um, because I think that it can happen that, you know, a taxpayer doesn't tell their accountant because they just didn't know they were supposed to and the accountant didn't ask. But I think okay. in the cases that we're discussing, the accountant asked. Like, it, it was, you know, it was clear that, that the person was asked about their foreign assets and, you know, they said no and, and, mm -hmm. and didn't tell them. That's correct. And also we're seeing, at least the cases I, I know of, we're seeing even worse, like they're trying to hide the source of income. They're saying to get the money back to them, you know, they're trying to wash it in a way and say, oh, this was the company performed services for this entity and that's what the money's about. But meanwhile, it's passing through a Liechtenstein foundation. And, and we've got facts where you're saying, no, the, this is ridiculous. This taxpayer clearly was willful. And I don't think we need to look at a word reckless or willful blindness. What I was going to say is I think because all of these things can potentially fall under willfulness, I think in these cases, maybe a better way that we, we, we should say is it's clear that they were willful because you know, they made intentional acts, um, mm -hmm. you know, to, to basically, you know, to, to you know, not to report and so to. on and so forth. Right. To hide yes. rather than, you know, inadvertently not, not doing something. And so I just wanted to to to, to add that. Um, in, this in other case, words, in our you know, view, it goes beyond it goes beyond reckless. It goes beyond gross negligence. Correct. The concern I have is that by the courts introducing these words, okay, and saying if you're reckless, you can be willful, or if you have willful blindness, that that is willfulness for purposes of an F bar penalty that we will get away in due time, the cases will get away from the bad facts and what might be more neutral type facts, because you're using a word like reckless or you're using a word like willful blindness, well, it opens the door for the IRS maybe to bring in cases that are not as egregious as the ones we've been seeing, because they will say, look, this case said the guy was reckless and um, that counts for um, a taxpayer being willful. So my concern is that we're seeing a door opening for the IRS, I think, to to use these words and to drag in taxpayers that might not otherwise be what we consider to be willful today. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically putting a, a, a lower standard of evidence um, you know, on what is willful, where, where before, you know, intentional acts, um, where somebody acted with intent, um, you know, constituted willful, 
Now, I, I agree with you, you know, by the courts using these words, especially in cases where somebody acted willfully, but they're saying that, okay, it was reckless, um, that recklessness creates a, a lower burden uh, for the IRS to say that the person acted willfully. Um, potentially. And, and that's, what I, I was, was, that's right. Potentially. And we, yeah. We've also seen the courts saying, in order to be willful, the burden of proof is, of course, on the IRS to prove the taxpayer was willful in his, his actions. And the level of the burden of proof, we always thought it would be the same level where one has to show fraud, which is a clear and convincing evidence. But the courts are saying that's not required. The courts are saying a lower standard is required by a preponderance of the evidence, which basically means if, if, if the IRS can show 51%, <laughs> that, you know, what they're saying is 51%, it's more, more, bigger, they're going to win. Yeah, more likely than not. Yep. So we're seeing the courts seem to be giving the IRS a little bit of leeway. And, you know, whether or not we agree with that, it's, it's legal precedent. So we have to deal with it when we're, we're advising a client. You see, one of the biggest benefits, in, in my view, of go, going through um, OVDP is, as, 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 you, as you said, Virginia, it, it sort of, it, it appears that the standard of what constitutes willfulness uh, is, is getting lower and lower, meaning that it's more and more likely that, you know, a certain activity or inactivity could be considered um, willful. And so I think, you know, when interviewing a client, some of the, the additional things that are very important to look at for example, or, or what is the taxpayer's level of, of, of education? You know, because mm -hmm. if you have somebody who's a, who's a lawyer or an accountant, for example, and they didn't, you know, report foreign income or assets, they're probably going to be held to a higher standard of, you know, they knew or should have known that they should have reported it. Or what is the person's business experience? You know, are, are, are they a U.S. person by birth? Did they immigrate? So I think there's, there's a lot of things that we have to look at, you know, in determining not only what, is it clear that the person is willful, but is there a potential risk that they could be considered willful? And, and if the answer is yes, I'm not saying that OVDP is the, over, is the only option because, as we've discussed, you, you sometimes have these borderline cases. I mean, sometimes it's very clear that a person was not willful. And I think in those cases, Virginia, you and I would both say, you know, go the streamlined procedure or, you know, maybe one of the delinquent filing procedures, you know, OVDP really seems uh, un unnecessary. Um, and then you also have those cases where, you know, a client very clearly was intentional. The very, there was maybe very clearly something that be, should be criminal. And then OVDP is, is a very clear option um, and probably the preferable one. But we also see a lot of these cases that are kind of in, 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 in the middle where, you know, somebody, um, you know, like I said, you know, was a, maybe has an accounting degree or extensive business experience or, you know, they were they, their accountant asked them if they received, you know, had foreign income or assets and, they failed to answer the question or something like that. So there are these borderline cases where, you know, you could go streamline procedure and, and try to make an argument, but the taxpayer is really going to be taking on some, some risk because mm -hmm. it's not 100% clear that they were non-willful. And in those cases, I think the OVDP offers uh, a, a big benefit in, in its certainty, right? Because with, with the OVDP, um, you really have certainty, right? I mean, there's, there's, it removes any sort of uh, potential, uh, uh, you know, criminal prosecution. Uh, you remove the potential of, of the fraud penalty, which is, you know, 75%. Um, and so in, 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 you limit it to, we'll talk about the specific requirements of OVDP later, but I think that those are the people, like I was talking about earlier, that are really going to, to miss out on, on the benefits of OVDP with it going away. 
is, is its certainty and reduced penalty framework uh, as opposed to a standard audit. Because those people, you know, if, if they decide, and, and a lot of them do, they decide, well, you know, we don't want to, you know, have to pay, um, you know, the, the OVDP, even though it offers certainty, there are still penalties that need to be paid uh, in the OVDP. And with the streamlined procedures, there's either no penalty or much reduced penalty below what the OVDP penalty is. And so a lot of times people will, will want to opt for, for those streamlined procedures, but, you know, they don't have that protection in the streamlined procedure from, um, you know, audit or criminal prosecution or, or the fraud penalty. So there really are some, some benefits to the OVDP that, um, you know, people should, should really consider if they've been on the fence for it for, for you know, recent years. When we talk about the penalty framework, a lot of times what I've seen is that, you know, you'll, you'll have an offshore asset or an offshore account that's not clearly within the penalty framework and you don't know what's going to happen with it is going to be included because you take 27.5% of the highest value of any offshore account or asset that was in any way related to tax noncompliance. And, you know, sometimes you get something that's not clear. And I think that people have to be aware that sometimes that penalty framework is not crystal clear for certain cases. So, you know, I always go through it with a client. In the worst case, this is going to happen with that. We will try and keep this asset out of the penalty base, but we don't know that the IRS will agree with us. So, you know, people have to be careful when they're understanding the penalty framework of OVDP that they're really getting the full information. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, in, in, in that circumstance, that, you know, they really do need the advice of a professional to make sure that, um, you know, they fully under, understand that. But I guess there still is uh, more certainty in, 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 in the OVD, OVDP framework, uh, because even if certain assets that you were trying to exclude were included, at least you're limiting the, the penalty to that 27 and a half per percent. Um, you know, correct. Because if you don't have that, you don't know different. where you don't know where the IRS may go with penalties if they assert the fraud penalty. Seventy-five percent of the tax yeah. due. That's that's yeah. I I understand. I, I agree. Mean, the there. only the, the the only one where I think it's really where where you really have to be careful with OBDP is in the case of you know income producing, uh, you know, foreign real estate. Uh, because there's no, you know, sort of information return or anything where you have to disclose uh, foreign real estate. So outside of the OVDP penalty framework, you know, ownership of foreign real estate wouldn't be subject to any type of penalty. Uh, mm -hmm. But within the OVDP framework, it, it, it would be. So I think that's the one that's really tricky with OVDP uh, is undisclosed foreign, foreign real estate income. But let's talk a little bit about the alternatives to OVDP. We mentioned the sure. traditional voluntary disclosure practice of the IRS. They've had that in the criminal investigation division for, for a very long time. Um, but we have no penalty framework. We don't know. Uh, there's no fixed penalty structure. And my guess is that if you had to go into the VDP, voluntary disclosure practice, that's been the traditional one because the IRS has closed the OVDP, I think that they may be much harsher in applying the penalties than, than would otherwise apply had you joined OVDP. So I, I think if you're a taxpayer that does have criminal issues, I, I don't think you want to wait around and, and take your chances in a VDP. Um, this issue of complying prospectively that we mentioned before, I think if a taxpayer looks at that, they have to understand that the statute of limitations is the most important element in their decision to comply prospectively. If a taxpayer has never filed a tax return, the statute of limitations clock never starts to tick, which means the IRS can come after them with regard to that particular tax year where they had an unfiled tax return. They can come after them forever. Once a taxpayer files his tax return, the statute of limitations generally 
starts to tick, the clock starts to tick. And usually it's, it's a three year statute, um, but the three years can be extended and go beyond. It can go to six years um, for certain cases. And if you have not filed under recent, more recent tax laws, if you have not filed a, an information return pertaining to a foreign asset, for example, if you didn't file a form 5471 with regard to your foreign corporation, then that particular tax return, that tax year will remain open until the IRS gets that particular form. So we're seeing that with regard to offshore assets, the statute of limitations can become very long indeed. And if you have fraud involved with the tax return, then the tax statute of limitations is also not, not starting to run. So that tax year will remain open. So when a taxpayer looks at the idea of forgetting about the past and complying prospectively only, I think one of the most important things that needs to be discussed with him, <clears throat> him or her, is the issue of the statute of limitations. If, if the person is um, thinking of expatriation, then he needs to really understand that under the expatriation rules, he must have five years of past tax compliance in order to escape certain harsh expatriation tax results, such as the exit tax. So everyone's case will really be highly fact sensitive and that the taxpayer has to make sure that he's getting that information from an advisor. And if he's not, then he's not getting the best tax advice and, and he can't really make a good decision. Recently, uh, I've actually had it's been many years since I've heard anybody uh, be interested in, in doing a, a so-called quiet disclosure. Uh, mm -hmm. But recently, I've had a few inquiries from people basically wanting to do this. Um, I have too. I think it's know, becoming a, a fashionable thing to look at. Well, you know, what I think, so, you know, for for, for you know, I think so, so what's important to mention about quiet disclosures is a quiet disclosure is not, you know, a, a sanctioned IRS amnesty program, like a streamlined procedure or an OBDP or something like that. And, you know, quiet disclosures were really popular before the introductions of um, the, the streamlined procedures, because, you know, people who acted non-willfully, you didn't really fit in OBDP but they really didn't have an option. So this, you know, these quiet disclosures became somewhat popular. And, and let's and just clarify for everyone what it means, what it means. A quiet disclosure means the person is just saying, okay, I didn't file my tax returns, so I'm going to file them all I now. I filed them incorrectly. Yes, or, or I, I filed, filed them incorrectly, incorrectly and I'm going to file them. amended tax returns and just send them in and through the Correct. normal IRS procedures for filing tax returns. They're not doing anything special. They're not Correct. in the horn and saying, hey, look, I was non-compliant and I, I fit into this non-willful category. They're just sending in these either amended or late tax returns with any foreign information returns and foreign FBARs. Maybe they're doing FBARs as well that were late. So it's just a you know kind of quiet way of trying to sneak in under the wire, to, so to speak. Right. It's basically like you said, filing delinquent tax returns or, or, or correcting ones that, that were filed just as you would with any other normal tax return. And, and again, these were really popular, you know, a long time ago. And then when the IRS came out with, you know, this, this wide range of, of amnesty programs, there's, there's five in total. Um, you know, the IRS basically came out and said, hey, you know, we know that people have been making quiet disclosures. Uh, you know, we kind of urge you to, to stop because we've created a program for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't take part in one of those, then we're going to be looking at the quiet disclosures a lot more carefully. Because if somebody does a quiet disclosure and is escaping without paying penalties or anything, that's unfair for the people that have gone through the effort and expense of going through an, an amnesty program. Um, and I think the reason why they're kind of coming up more again is because of this, this false sense of security that 
you know, the IRS really hasn't done anything with the FATCA data yet. Um, mm-hmm. qu- I think quiet, quiet disclosures, you know, there may be some situations in the future once OVDP closes um, where a quiet disclosure might be something to look at again. Uh, but I think for the, the last several years that, that they were, were very risky, um, you know, I, I, I think, think that, that the risky. VD... I don't feel comfortable with them at all. Yeah. That's me. No, I just, I, I, no I'm... But if a client understands all the risks involved and the possible penalties, if he gets audited or pulled, then, yeah. you know, that's his choice. Yeah. So again, you know, the, 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 this is not a sanctioned IRS program. You know, the IRS has, has indicated that they're, they're looking at them very, very carefully, and you have no, um, you know, protection or limitations on on audits or penalties or potential criminal sanctions. But I think one of the scariest things is, you know, if you do do this, the quiet disclosure route you know, you still have to wait for the statute of limitations to run out to know if you're, you're safe, so to speak. So once mm-hmm. you file, you, you know, depending on, depending on the level of uh, income, whether there was a substantial understatement or, or, or potential criminal activity, you have to wait for either that three or six year period to, to expire. So I, I'm with you, Virginia. I'm not a fan of them. Um, but I do think we're going to start seeing more and more inquiries for them with, with OBDP. Uh, yes. going away. What I do with a client that, you know, feels that that's the route he wants to go, I point out to him or her the issues that will be raised by the IRS. For example, what hard questions is the IRS going to ask this person? And and I say, you've got to be ready to answer those questions, okay? And sometimes they feel comfortable with, okay, my excuse will be, my answer will be. But a lot of times I think it gets them to rethink if they really want to go that route. Because if well, they get they will be asked very difficult questions and they have to be ready for that. Well, and the other thing that I would, that I would add, and I don't know if this is your experience too, Virginia, but I, I think a lot of times when, when people are considering, you know, their options for getting back into compliance, you know, they look at the potential penalties, they look at the potential costs. Um, and I think that most of these people have never had an interaction with the government before. So they've probably never been under indictment or investigation or audit or, mm-hmm. you know, questioned by the IRS or anything else. And mm-hmm. they just kind of think like, you know, if, if it's never happened to you, I think a lot of them just think like, oh, you know, it's not going to happen to me or, you know, they just kind of write it off or they think it'll be easy. Um, but I think you and I have, have, you know, a lot of experience with the IRS and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, the IRS does ask tough questions. Yes. Yeah. Well, at least with my clients, I try and prepare them for that. And, you know, if it happens, some of them, you know, have, they do have good answers. So, but they, for whatever reason, they don't want to go into streamlined and, and they wish to do this perspective because maybe the streamlined uh, timing will involve costs they feel, you know, they can't meet or whatever. So they, they, they want to just maybe do a quiet filing or perspective filing and they feel they will deal with the IRS questions when they come. And so that's, a, again, the client's yep. choice. You just have to prepare them for it. So streamlined sure. is still, even though the IRS is closing the OVDP, streamlined is still available for the uh, streamlined foreign offshore procedure and streamlined domestic uh, offshore proce- procedure. Um, we don't know if these are closing. You know, the IRS has always said, and they said again when they're closing the OVDP, they said streamlined is still open, but as we've said, we can close it at any time. So we don't know if that's and, and not just right or not, and and not just and not just closing Virginia, but I think one of the other things that we that is a possibility with with streamline is we could see it change as as it did in you know in 2014 um, mm-hmm. to where you never know if they they you know change the 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 criteria or introduce a penalty framework or something else, and I, I think that's a possibility as well. 
Agreed, agreed. Um, we've seen as Streamline has developed because Streamline came in in 2012, it was too strict, the, the, the parameters were so tight that most people couldn't fit into them. The IRS woke up and, and changed the rules in 2014 and made it more accessible to the average person who may have had a non-wilful situation. But what I've seen is, for example, the IRS becoming far more demanding in the fact statement that's required. You have to submit a very, a very detailed statement of fact to basically prove that your tax non-compliance was non-wilful. So according to the IRS definition, non-wilful means due to negligence, inadvertence, or mistake, or conduct that is the result of a good faith misunderstanding of the requirements of the law. And in the beginning, people were just sending in, I believe, very simple statements of fact, not detailed at all. And IRS started to call those, those taxpayers and, and asked for more facts. I've always prepared very detailed statements of fact for my clients because generally speaking, that their facts were very good facts. And, you know, of course, if we did have any bad facts, you have to mention them, you have to explain them. And we've seen the IRS scrutiny of the statements of fact, which is the linchpin to being successful in a streamlined procedure. We've seen the IRS scrutiny, I think, just becoming more and more um, harsh. I don't know if that's been. Yeah, I, I, I would. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think. I think in the um, in in the very beginning, you know, I, I mean, we were, you know, I'm, I'm the same opinion of you. We've always tried to send in fairly detailed uh, statements of fact, but um, you know, I think in the beginning, a lot of people were just writing like basically, I didn't know, <laughs> and signing yeah. the statements, and 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 they yeah. and they were going through. And uh, as, as you said, I think now, you know, the IRS is really scrutinizing them. And if they see any inconsistencies or, or an opening um, of something that could potentially be willful, they're contacting the people and, and asking for further information. So, yeah, I, I completely, completely agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think one of the things, yeah, I, I want to go over the, 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 some of the criteria for the streamlined procedures really quickly. But I think one of the things that's important to mention with regard to OVDP is that if you've done a streamlined procedure, you can't do an OVDP. So OVDP has kind of got to be, um, you know, the first option. Uh, because yeah. I've actually seen a case like that where somebody did a streamlined procedure, but they weren't completely uh, forthcoming in it. And uh, later, you know, wanted to get, to get that corrected and, and, and they were precluded yeah. from, from OVDP and, and had to do VDP. So, um, but, you know, just really quickly to go over the, the, the streamlined procedure. So as Virginia said, there's two, there's a streamlined foreign offshore procedure and a streamlined domestic offshore procedure. The streamlined foreign offshore procedure is the one that is traditionally used by Americans uh, abroad that you know didn't know they had to file or they did file and it was incorrect so again you know we've talked a lot about non-willfulness in order to be eligible uh the failure to non-comply uh, has to have been non-willful there's a non-residency requirement which means that in one of the last three years um the the taxpayer would have had to have been outside the u.s for 330 days or more um and that's only one year out of three only one year out of three. A lot one of year. people don't understand that. They think they had to be each year. Right. It's only you need one yeah, year exactly. where you were 330 days outside of America. Correct. And and one of the other ones, and Virginia, I'll let you discuss this one because I, I know that we've both seen a lot of cases like this, is technically the streamlined procedure in order to qualify, you have to have failed to report and pay tax on income from a foreign financial asset. Foreign financial asset being, you know, a bank account, an investment account, and dividends from a foreign corporation, something like that. But, you know, what do you do if you don't have any foreign income um, from a foreign financial asset, but you have, let's say, foreign wages, which is not considered uh, income from a foreign financial asset, and that's the only thing that you didn't report? Right. Um, yes, we've seen a lot of that. 
And in fact, when I first called the IRS to ask the hotline about that kind of situation, the revenue agent said to me, of course they have foreign income that's not been reported. It's a salary. And I said, but your, your instructions talk about income from foreign financial assets. Oh, oh, well, oh, don't worry about it. Very lax, you know, no problem. Um, I always put it on the statement of fact that pointed out the only thing we have is this. I cross out on the certification because of this certification form that has to be filled out. It, it says, and I have failed to report and pay tax on income from a foreign financial asset. I cross that out. Uh, have the taxpayer cross that out. And um, we've never had a problem getting anyone through Streamlined who fell into that situation where they did not have um, income from a foreign financial asset and only had wages. But again, you want to be, you know, you want to be detailed. You want to point it out to the IRS so they can never come back and say, hey, you didn't belong in here because you didn't admit to us that you just had income from salary. You didn't point it out. Of course, if they're looking at your tax returns, they will see that. But the way I understand the IRS deals with the streamlined cases is that the tax returns are actually going through the computers in the normal procedural way for filing of and processing of tax returns. And the revenue agent sits and reads separately the statements of fact and the specific form that the client has had to fill out, Form 14653 for this um, streamlined foreign offshore or the other form for the streamlined foreign domestic. They sit and just look at the statement of fact and that little form. They don't actually go through the tax returns unless of course they think something suspicious, they will pull them. But in the normal course, they're not looking at that. They're only looking at the no. form and the statement. So if you haven't okay. pointed it um, out there, they may be able to come back to you, I don't know. I just always yeah, I, I it think out. I think you know I, I always think whenever there's something that's sort of out of the ordinary, even like if it's on a tax return or statement of facts or something, you're always better off bringing it to the IRS's attention so you're not giving them you know some sort of an opportunity to argue that you were trying to hide something. Um, Correct. But Correct. Um, anyway, for for the streamlined foreign offshore procedure, non-willful, meet the non-residency requirement, failed to have, you know reported and paid tax on uh, uh in pay tax on, on income something. from a foreign financial <laughs> asset yeah exactly you can't be under uh civil examination or audit or criminal investigation if you are you're ineligible um the street in order what, what's required with the streamlined foreign offshore procedure is you have to file uh three years tax returns for which the due date has already passed so for example um Right now, if you were to do a streamlined procedure, it would include years 14, 15, and 16, because the due date for 17, which is April 17th this year, has not yet passed. Um, Correct. You also have to do six years of FBARs for which the due date uh, has not yet passed. So, you know, in this case, again, 17 would not be included. You have to pay any back taxes and interest, but no penalty. You have to sign the certification of non-willfulness with the, the statement of facts, as uh, you mentioned. Um, and, and again, there's, there's no penalty involved. And um, just two points I'd like to bring up here, Jimmy. Yeah. When, yep. when they, we talk about the requirement that a taxpayer not be under civil exam or criminal investigation by the IRS, this is a case I've seen where the person may have gotten a letter from the IRS saying, where's your 2015 tax return? That to me is not a civil examination. So that person may still be eligible to go in to a streamlined procedure. Um, that's, co th that's correct, but I, but I believe for OBDP that wouldn't be the case, right? That would be different, I think. I'm not sure about that. I would need to really look. I'm not sure about the level of contact that the IRS has. I, 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 would, need, I, I would need to look myself, but I, I believe with OBDP it is you have not Any been contact. contacted about your non-compliance. Yeah. Oof. Right. Scary. Okay. Um, um, the other thing is when we say that the requirement is to file three years of tax returns, if someone wants to expatriate, I've had no issue putting in five years of tax returns so the taxpayer can have five years of tax compliance prior to expatriation. Um, and I believe you've had a similar uh, 
Yep, experience. We, we've done the same yeah. thing several times. Yeah. So, so clients who want to expatriate, they can use Streamlined. It's it's worked, at least to date, it's worked. Yep. Um, the domestic right. one, Jimmy, you just want to quickly tell them the difference there from the foreign Streamlined yeah, domestic. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, the only major difference here is is basically this is also for people who are not willful that they don't meet that non-residency requirement. Um, they failed to pay tax report income for uh, from a foreign financial assets and they're not under civil or criminal examination by the IRS. The big difference with uh, the, the domestic offshore procedure is that uh, one, you have to have timely filed all your back tax returns. So, you know, with, with the, the offshore procedure, you know, this is also for people that didn't know you had to file and didn't file their tax returns. But with the domestic ones, you have to have filed your, your tax returns. You don't have to have filed the FRs, but you have to have filed the tax returns. So you have to basically file amended tax returns uh, for uh, three years for three tax years for which the due date has passed, and and six years tax returns. Sign the certification, and there is a five percent penalty based on the highest value of the uh, foreign assets that were not disclosed. Uh, so that's you know less. Uh, Twenty-two and a half percent less than than the OVDP penalty, uh, uh, but uh, still is a penalty, unlike with the the foreign offshore. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you look at the year-end value to to get that five percent. It's not the highest Correct. value yeah. during any time in the year, so people have you know a little bit more clarity on on uh, the year-end value. Yes, if you don't have unreported income and you were non-willful, but you you just simply failed to file one or more FBARs or international information returns, for example, the Form 5471 to report your ownership in a foreign corporation, then you don't need to go into Streamline. You don't need to go into OVDP. The IRS has separate um, delinquent submission procedures. They have one specifically for FBARs, and they have one for the international information returns. And Jimmy, I know you've used these for for some of your clients. Um, I've never yeah. I've I've used them as well for the F bars. I've never had any issue um, with with clients yeah. who want to file F bars. But remember, you had to have reported and paid tax on all of your income. Exactly. Yeah, we've used the streamline. I, sorry, the delinquent filing procedure for um, you know F bars, but we've also done some for international information returns. Most of them have been uh, like 5471s or, or 8621s to report PFIX, where the people okay. have like reported the dividend income and you know paid the tax on it and everything. They just didn't know they had to file the 8621. Um, right. So we have, we have used them. I think that the, the key to these that make them very tricky is, as you said, um, a lot of times, you know, they failed the report like two euros of, of interest income and now they're precluded from from these filing procedures. Um, and you know one of the things with, with the FBAR procedure you have to include a statement, you know, basically explaining why you didn't file an FBAR with mm -hmm. with the um, delinquent international information uh, submission procedure. It's a little bit of a higher standard. Uh, you actually have to include a reasonable cause statement. So with the delinquent FBAR, you're basically saying, hey, I'm sorry, I didn't know I found out. Whereas with, with the information returns, you really have to explain why your failure is due to reasonable cause, uh, which is, you know, requires a little bit, a little bit more work. Okay. But these are, are some alternatives too. Right. So you want to talk about? You want to talk about the IRS's newest in endeavor here, Virginia? The passport revocation? Yes. That's our, that's our next slide. Okay. Well, um, this has been in the works for a while. I remember blogging about this some years back when um, special reports were commissioned by Congress about the tax debt and uh, how, could, how could the IRS get people to pay it. And one of the things that was suggested was, hey, you know what? The passport 
if you don't renew their passport or you revoke the passport for people who are not paying up on their tax debt, then you'll be able to collect an awful lot of money that's owed to the IRS. So finally, uh, law was passed in 2015, giving the State Department the authority to revoke or deny passports in the case of something called seriously delinquent tax debts. And um, there's a lot of procedure that goes into it, but essentially the IRS certifies to the State Department that the taxpayer has what's called a seriously delinquent tax debt. And once that certification is received by the State Department, then the State Department can take the action and revoke or not issue the passports or not, re not renew them. Um, seriously delinquent tax debt is it's got to be a legally enforceable tax debt of fifty thousand dollars or more and that includes that includes um, penalties and and interest I believe as interest as well so it's quite easy to get up to that number the number is indexed for inflation it's fifty one thousand for 2018 um, the IRS has to have issued a federal tax lien once got to have been filed and all the administrative remedies have either lapsed or been exhausted. And that is, you know, people come to me and they're afraid they're not going to get their passport renewed because they haven't filed their tax returns. That is not rising to the status of a seriously delinquent tax debt. You've got to have a tax lien being filed against you. And most likely you will know that, but if you've been living abroad and you have not advised the IRS of a change of address, you may not know that a federal tax lien has been filed against you because there's no way for the IRS to send you the information. Um, another way that um, you can have a legally enforceable tax debt is if a levy has been issued. But again, if the IRS does not have a current address for you and a levy has been issued, you may have a problem because you might not know. Um, the IRS just started very recently enforcing this law, even though it was passed in 2015. Enforcement didn't begin until this past February. I do not have any client that this has happened to. Um, do you, Jimmy, have any that it's it's happened no, to? Or? No, 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 not yet. Um, but it's coming. I think, I think there's, I think that, but it's coming. And, you know, I think there's, there's two points that I wanted to add to this slide. The, the one thing that I'm, I'm very nervous about with this passport revocation law is in the case of a jeopardy assessment. Um, because, you know, the, the IRS has the ability to do something called a jeopardy assessment. Basically, what that means is if a taxpayer is under audit, where basically the IRS is still trying to figure out um, if the taxpayer owes additional money or not, at that point in time, there's no legally enforceable tax debt. So they couldn't revoke the passport. However, mm -hmm. if the IRS is coming up on the, the expiration of the statute of limitations uh, and, and they haven't res, you know, figured out the audit yet, they have the ability to do something called a jeopardy assessment, which is basically where they just guess what the possible highest amount is that the taxpayer uh, would owe. And they make an assessment for that amount of money. And then when they finish the audit, they can always adjust that down. But that is what's called, but that is, um, that, that is, you know, a tax debt once the, the assessment is made. And, and they could file a lien or a levy uh, on that amount of money. So that, that I'm a little bit nervous about because yes. if, if that were the case, you, you could have people, uh, you know, subject to passport revocation that are technically still under audit. Um, the other thing that I've seen, which is not uh, the passport revocation, and I have actually seen this applied to, to, to clients, is what's called a customs hold which is, you know, when you're traveling into the United States, if you have uh, tax issues, even if you don't owe any tax, but maybe you just have unfiled returns, the IRS has the ability to, to flag your account that when you come yes. into the U.S. that you basically get pulled aside 
and, and questioned and, you know, asked how you're going to resolve this, this tax debt. And, and that I have seen. Mm -hmm. I've seen that too. Okay. So this passport revocation law, it's fairly, very new. Um, it's, it's recently just gone into enforcement phase. So I'm sure we'll be learning more about that as time goes on. And I, I'm sure Jimmy and I will blog about it when we, we see a real case come up. Um, one development that I find very interesting, Jimmy, is pertaining to our, I think it's our last slide, the visa to enter yeah. the U.S. Expatriates are now, expatriate meaning someone who's given up their, their U.S. citizenship or perhaps a long-term green card, they're now being asked to prove that they've been tax compliant. I guess, you know, I have not had a client that this has happened to, but I've been hearing about it. And I, I know that some people from your your side, Jimmy, have had clients that have been asked. So maybe you can tell us more about this. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think that this is a, a, a being asked to prove the tax compliance is is something new. So first of all, I've only seen any of this apply uh, in the case of someone that's expatriated and is now a citizen of a country that is not on a visa waiver program with the U.S. Um, and, you know, because if there's a visa waiver program, you, you do that online ESTA, you know, they don't really look at it too closely. But if you're from a country where you actually have to go seek a, a visa to enter the U.S., um, you know, I've had several clients that have expatriated that have had a hard time uh, getting visas to get back into the U.S. over the years. But it's mainly been based on, um, you know, it's been denied for the reason that that they they ha they haven't firmly resettled in in you know their new country. There's not an, enough nexus in their new country of, of residence, is mm -hmm. what the the official denial said. But a couple of clients have told me that they were kind of unofficially told that hey, you know, if you didn't want to be American anymore, you can't go back, or you know, we assume you did it for tax reasons, so you know, no chance. But recently, we we did have a client, um, you know fully tax compliant, everything else, clear case where the person um, was firmly resettled in, in, you know, their new country of residence. And he was asked to prove uh, his tax compliance in order to get a visa. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's a new development. Uh, one that I've never read anything about, you know, that they were going to start doing this. But uh, no. apparently it's happening. It'll be, be interesting to see if, if, if it continues. And was it was he being asked for five years of tax compliance? In other words, they were going along the expatriation tax regime, which requires five years of tax yes. compliance prior. So they asked for five years. Okay, this, this brings up a very interesting point for clients, whether or not they have a visa waiver, you know, country involved. This issue of proving tax compliance for the five years prior to your expatriation date is not only important maybe for this new development, but for people that uh, are giving gifts or leaving inheritances to any U.S. persons, we know that under proposed Treasury regulation, yeah. those recipients of a gift or a bequest from a, uh, an expatriate, they will be asked to prove the tax compliance of the person who expatriated, who gave them the gift or the inheritance. And that's going to be very, very difficult to do. So people have to get their tax compliance dossier up to date and very complete because we don't know yeah. what, when it's going to be asked and who it's going to be asked of. So that's, that's a really interesting development. Okay. So. Thank you so much. Thank you, okay. Virginia. It was a pleasure. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Right.